I, um, you know, it's always nice to be on these panels and, uh, and to, of course, visit uh, people that I've known from the past and, and to meet new uh, people and to hear stories because I always find that in situations like this I end up learning, which I end up learning about myself, I end up learning about other people. And it's so interesting, I just uh, bet with something that you started saying, I mean, when you started uh, you started your introduction, I mean, you, you said these simple words, you said, I began writing to find myself. And it's so funny when you think about just that little statement, how easy it is to articulate, but how a lot of us have such a hard time when we're asked, why do you, why, why do you write, why, why, uh, why did you start writing? It's so hard for, uh, I know at least it's been hard for me to just simply say, well, to find myself. And, uh, you know, I think that it really, for me, it really sums up um, really why I began writing, which was, uh, which was about 16 years ago. It seems like such a long time ago. But of course, I'm, I'm that middle generation. I'm, I'm, there were the writers that, that preceded me. There were writers like Beverly. There were writers like Lee. There were writers like uh, my adopted mom, Maria Campbell. There were uh, writers even before them, people like Pauline Johnson, different people in our community. And of course, I think we've each, through the generations, have, have learned how to find ourselves. And <clears throat> I know for me that, that when I was in elementary school, I'm, I'm 42 now, um, when I was in elementary school in the 70s, uh, the mid-70s, that um, the way that the history about Aboriginal people, not to mention more specifically for me about Métis people, the way that history was being treated was as if we had all been kind of relegated to the past. It was these, these historical books, it was these books that, that basically we, we got to look at pictures, we got to kind of find out where the tribes were in Canada. And I remember yeah. thinking my, my, uh, my, um, my original connection with that was the way that Métis people were being taught in elementary school and even in the beginning of high school, is that for me I had wanted to be more associated with, uh, with, with, uh, with Indian people. I wanted to be more associated because I'd always said no matter how raggedy and poor the Indians were being portrayed, at least they had a culture. The way we were being portrayed as Métis people is that we had no culture. We weren't really Aboriginal people. We really had no history. Our heroes, our rightful heroes, our leaders, the people that tried to preserve who we were, not only our lands, but our languages, um, those people, of course, were taught to be uh, villains. Those people were taught to be traitors that uh, completely went against the formation of, of what we've come to know as Canada. So that was just on one level in school. The other, the other level was is that there were no other kids, very few other Aboriginal kids in school, Métis kids, that were growing up the way I was growing up. I came from a generation, a mother that... Um, that uh, had experienced addiction, a mother that had uh, experienced um, discrimination, uh, a mother that had experienced uh, domestic violence. Um, so I grew up in an environment like that. I grew up in foster homes. I grew up with uh, different aunties and uncles. I grew up kind of being fostered out. So of course, my sense of myself was very, very uh, nil. It was very kind of askew. And so by the time I actually became cognizant of the fact that, um, that uh, I was Aboriginal, that I was Métis, there was very little for me to relate to in school. There were no books. There were no books in the library shelves where I could go and I could find stories about people like me from this time, people that were growing up in an environment that I grew up, people that were growing up in a single parent home, people that were growing up not knowing <coughs> their history their ancestors, 
and dealing with this whole sense of uh, disconnected disconnectedness. And on one hand, I was very lucky because I was that middle generation. And slowly, 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 books like uh, Beverly's, books like Lee's, books like my adopted mom's, their, their books were starting to find their way into the public school system. This happened, of course, before me. I mean, I started dropping out of uh, school in grade eight, and I eventually dropped out in, uh, in grade nine. There was no place for me in public school. And it was really after I had dropped out of, out of school and had really um, started my education again through through a place in Vancouver that uh, that was called the, the uh, Vancouver um, the Native Education Center in Vancouver, which is still going. I was the youngest student at the time that had been admitted into the school, and uh, it was really the first time in my life of where I was surrounded by my own community. I was surrounded by people that had grown up in similar situations. We were all looking for something, whether that was within each other, whether that was in trying to find family within each other, whether it was mothers in the school who had lost kids, lost their own parents, lost their grandparents. Um, so it was really through that experience that I began to start learning about who I was, not only as an Aboriginal person, but encouraged to learn about who are you, who are you as a Métis person, who are Métis people. This is where you come from, this is your history, who are you? Of all these questions that, uh, that, that were being uh, posed. And, you know, I think for me writing had always been one of those things, I think a lot <coughs> on the way I'd grown up. Um, writing for me was always one of those very solitary things. It was always, it, it was like my best friend. I didn't have to share it with anybody. I didn't have to talk to anybody. I could write my little poems. I could write my little stories. And I didn't have to share them with anybody. I didn't have to share my vulnerabilities or my feelings. The way I grew up, um, you you would not survive if you showed vulnerability. Yeah. And uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's issues that I'm still working on as, as a 42-year-old man. I think I'll probably end up working on for the rest of my life. It's another story. But uh, what I wanted to say was through that experience, through Native Education Center, that these books started finding their way to me. Stories that were being written down, stories, not, uh, and I'm not talking, you know, we've been throwing this word around today, traditional stories or what have you, but uh, contemporary stories, stories that, that, yes, span kind of the generations, but stories that I could relate to, stories that I could see my own mom in, stories that I could see myself in my auntie. And, um, you know, it was really through that that I began really to, to learn the power of storytelling. Of course, I had grown up. Um, I don't want to paint my, my childhood as all black growing up, because I grew up with uh, wonderful storytellers. I grew up with music. I grew up with, uh, with uh, uh, a love of reading, a love of books. And, um, you know, so I was very fortunate by the time I got to Native Education Center, like I said, to find these books. And with what I had been taught um, as a younger boy with the stories and things, things started to come together for me. And I realized at some point that, uh, that I might be able to be a storyteller too. I might be able to tell my own story. And um, I, I wanted, based upon what I had wanted in high school, to be able to go to the library shelf and to be able to find books that, uh, that talked about the real Louis Riel, that talked about the real Gabriel Dumont, that talked about the Red River Métis people, to talk about our history, to talk about those grandmothers of old, where our grandfathers came from, the family names, all these things that we can find now. The things that I wanted so much in, um, in school were the things that really became the catalyst for me writing and really became the catalyst for me writing about how I grew up. Because I'm part of that generation that, that has had to go and find themselves, not only figuratively, but have to find themselves culturally, has had to find themselves uh, ancestrally, family-wise. Um, 
you know, to, to be able to know where your family comes from, to be able to know the families that know those families, to be able to get the stories from them. And the other thing that I wanted to, to add to what I was saying is, of course, my, um, my experience was also that of, um, of an urban experience and of growing up in an urban uh, setting with other Aboriginal people who were all looking for a sense of identity and for all of us trying to find our place um, where we could articulate um, ourselves. So, I mean, I don't really have too much, uh, too much more to say. I just, I guess, really wanted to, I, I guess within probably what I've said, you can probably find uh, you know, a tension of coming to writing or, 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 or having to deal with those tensions. But uh, I know that uh, in my writing now, that that's still one of the things that really propels me forward with, the, with the writing, is that uh, it, it's not only storytelling, and uh, for me being fortunate to be able to also tell those stories in Crete, but to be able to um, preserve the history and to be able to create new histories, to be able to talk about this generation because there's a generation that is coming after me that are working on their CDs, that are working on their films, that are working on their, uh, their lyrics for their latest rap song, that are talking about their experiences of growing up young, growing up Aboriginal, growing up with, uh, I, I think, a lot of the same societal 